Good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome to our information event this evening for our MSc in Sustainability Leadership Program here at University of Galway. My name is Orla Linehan, and I'm the Academic Director of the program. So I'll kick off the event by giving you a brief overview of the program. Um, and then we'll hear from a number of our expert lecturers who teach on the course, along with one of our current students who's completing the program. Following that, I will introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Mr. Connor O'Dowd, the CEO at the Port of Galway. And Connor will discuss with us the importance and the need for upskilling in this area. Now, we will, of course, uh, ensure to leave some time at the end of the event for any questions that you might have. Um, but please feel free to pop any questions into the Q&A function as you're listening to the various talks and presentations. If any questions come to mind, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A and we will either try to address them during the chat um, or I will certainly um, allocate time at the end to, to answer your queries. So maybe to just start with giving you a broad overview of the program, I suppose one of the key objectives uh, of this course is to directly address the identified gap in sustainability leadership skills. Um, most of you may already be aware um, from your own roles and your own experience that many organizations are grappling with the transition towards a sustainable planet and society. For instance, SkillNet Ireland's report on Pellant for Ireland's Green Economy concludes that leadership is essential to encourage employees to engage with climate action and sustainability issues, yet such skills are currently in low supply. So this MSc in Sustainability Leadership will enable participants to formulate strategies to effectively drive sustainable business transformation going forward. Now, you might be wondering, how do we achieve this with this program? Well, we offer a wide interdisciplinary curriculum and we draw on expertise from many fields and disciplines across the university, including management, economics, marketing, finance, but also science, social science, engineering. And what this does is it allows participants to develop a multi-perspective and an innovative approach to designing sustainable solutions and sustainable business models going forward. So maybe just to give you a sense um, as to some of the content and, and the modules that are included on the program, um, in the first year, participants will very much gain a foundation to the core management and sustainability concepts. Um, so issues like life cycle thinking, circular economy, sustainable supply chain management, business ethics, organizational culture, etc. Now, the majority of the lectures in the first year are held online. But at the end of the first year, there will be two immersive learning in person blocks. Um, and each of these blocks comprise of three days each. So the first of these blocks will involve an international study visit to Bologna Business School in Italy. And the second block will comprise a number of field trips around the west of Ireland. Now, during these immersive learning experiences, participants on the program will engage in a number of company site visits, and this will allow students to actually experience firsthand how various organizations are actually transitioning towards a sustainable planet and society. Um, students will be exposed to a number of guest talks from industry thought leaders. And these industry thought leaders will share their, their own experience, their own journeys on sustainable transition strategies and actions that they're currently taking. And of course, one of the key benefits of these in-person in and immersive experiences is that it will allow students to network and collaborate with each other. Um, and particularly important for students on this program is that it will allow them to build a network of contacts with peers that have a similar mindset, a sustainable mindset, and it will allow them to form those partnerships and collaborations, which we know are key to driving the sustainability agenda going forward. 
So then moving into the second year of the course, the curriculum will further build on core business and leadership skills. But the program will also allow students to choose a number of elective modules. And this will allow participants to focus more narrowly um, on areas such as green finance, systems thinking, emissions reduction strategies, and stakeholder engagement. So I won't go into any more specific detail on the program outline um, here during the webinar, but I would highly encourage all of you to have a look at the program website um, and you'll be able to fully explore the detailed descriptions for each of the modules on the program. Um, and this will allow you to familiarize yourself with the type of content that you would be exposed to if you choose to take the program. So I do believe that one of my colleagues will pop the link to the, to the course webpage into the Q&A function um, and you'll be able to access the program website from there and familiarize yourself with it yourself. Um, before handing over to some of my colleagues, I'd just like to point out some other information points. Um, so the entry requirements for the program are that applicants must have a minimum of two years post-graduation working experience, along with a primary degree in any discipline or area, including business, science, social science, or engineering. Uh, the university is offering a number of scholarships to cover up to 50% of the tuition fees for the program. And further information on these scholarships is available on the program website. And lastly, if you have any other further queries arising after the event, if anything comes to mind afterwards and you would like some more information, please don't hesitate to contact our fantastic program administrator, Martina Huben-Sweeney. Martina will be only delighted to get back to you and help you with any queries that you may have. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides for the moment. Um, and I'm now going to give you the opportunity to hear from some of our teaching faculty on the program. So our first speaker this evening is Professor Christine Domigan. Christine is a professor of social marketing here in the J.E. Kern School of Business and Economics. Christine's research and teaching activities focus on critical emerging issues such as sustainability, climate action, systems change and transitions. She's the research leader for the Applied Systems Thinking Unit within the School of Business and Economics, and she works with many international partners in the UK, Europe, USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So Christine, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And we very much look forward to hearing about your work and the work that you're currently carrying out for the MSc in Sustainability Leadership. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, Orla. Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to this evening. So I'm really excited and really looking forward to meeting and working with many of you as part of two options for the course. So we've been thinking hard about the types of jobs that you're working in and that leadership role that Orla referred to about sustainability and about making change happen. And as part of Ireland Net Zero Simulator, you'll get the opportunity to think through the complexity that's involved in many of the sustainable decisions that a small company or a multinational is involved in. And some of those kind of decisions that you may already be experiencing as part of your work is whether you should be investing in transport and electric vehicles, or perhaps your money might be give you a better return on carbon emissions and lowering them if you were looking at packaging or perhaps waste. So to examine those different scenarios and the complexity behind them and the intricacies that are there, which aren't often easy to see when you're on the ground. We have, are in the process of developing specifically for you a simulator game that allows you as part of the team to role play different decisions and look at the implications, look at the challenges, look at what it means for staffing requirements, uh, perhaps your customers' behaviors have to change, or perhaps employee behavior has to change. So the simulator work that we will do 
will bring you through those different layers of complexity and allow you grapple with the various issues that are involved. And then we can help you to look at controversies as they're happening and give you exercises for yourself, but also for your work colleagues that will allow you apply that in the real world to real decisions. We're working with the government, the Taoiseach's office, the Climate Action Unit. We're working with various stakeholders here in Ireland who are heavily involved in the Climate Action Plan, in monitoring and measuring, and bringing all that expertise to bear as part of that module so that you get a kickstart to your own work. You get to look at the different policies and practices that are there, the different databases that may help you. And then we take that a stage further. So as well as knowing about sustainability, to be a leader, you have to make that change happen on the ground in your own organization. So when we move into the systems module, we give you an entirely an entire toolkit, uh, a load of templates that you can work through with your team. You can also work through with your classmates um, and look at what's happening in other industries to help you put together your own strategy. So we help you do um, SWOT analysis, stakeholder analysis. We help you look at um, the leverage points and role play and look at scenarios where you will get impact. Some of that impact may be very short term, but what you're really looking for is critical transformative impact. So we identify which leverage points will give you that, uh, what the return on investment is, and then say, how do you actually translate that into products, into services, into distribution, into the technologies that you use as well? And these are toolkits that we are using with organizations like UNICEF, but also with organizations, smaller companies that are accelerating their green journey and their green experience as well. And then to put the icing on the cake, as Orla says, we are bringing in um, pioneering and leading guest speakers to help and augment that and share their experiences as well to round out the benefits that you get from these courses and for the program in general. Orla, back over to you. Fantastic, Christine. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I, I nearly want to sign up for the program myself. And I've often thought that with some of my colleagues and their lectures, I'd love to just sit in the back and actually participate as a student. Um, and certainly for your modules, uh, I think there's going to be a real case of applying those decisions and seeing what happens as a result yeah. of those decisions. So real practical yeah. experience. And it's going to be exciting uh, next year to work with you on those modules. So thank you very much, Christine, for those very fascinating insights. Um, I'll now introduce our next lecturer is Dr. Johanna Clancy. Johanna is a lecturer in business enterprise and her research interests include social enterprise and civic engagement. Johanna leads the business school's commitment to the UN principles for responsible management education. And she teaches the responsible management and leadership module on the MSc in sustainability leadership program. Johanna, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And the floor is yours. Great, thanks Orla, you can hear me okay? Super. Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, thank you for your interest in this uh, really brilliant master's program, which I had the joy to teach on just this past semester. Um, so my background is in business management, uh, social enterprise and, and leadership studies. And that's really what I bring as, as a foundation element to this course, uh, to this program. And, you know, the, the reason that a module like this um, was, was integrated into the program is because leaders and managers and those of you that are working in this field or hoping to work in this field will see that you know the toolkits and templates and the challenges that are ever present in trying to bring this um this aspect of sustainability and and the SDGs into everyday practice so this is 
um, despite all, all the theory that we have, it, it very much is a, a hands-on, interactive, uh, action learning type module, uh, which I think students really enjoy. So it's, it's a large module in that it's 10 credits, which is double what a lot of the other modules are. Um, and because of that, then there is that extra element of, of dedicated uh, group projects that, that takes up quite a bit of time throughout this. However, uh, student feedback has illustrated that, that students really enjoy this, this hands-on group project. Um, you know, and I just touch on a couple of things that both Christine and Orla said. Um, you know, and Christine talked about stakeholder management and the toolkits that we'll give you. So ideas uh, and concepts like stakeholder management and systems thinking um, and awareness and action on the SDGs really do permeate throughout the program. But this module is quite foundational in that it gives a holistic oversight and it really does bring in small elements of all the other modules that you will study as part of this program. Uh, we start off looking at the importance of business and society. So the huge role that business plays um, and how business can do good for and with society and, and for the environment. Um, so rather than it being simply a bolt on action um, or, or instrumental in, in what companies are doing, showing really that that corporations, that organizations can do good. Uh, in their everyday practices and, and how business leaders can become more responsible and, as I said, integrate this into, into everyday practice. Um, we have a strong focus on the ESG imperative. Um, and as we know, there, there's legislation in now uh, with further legislation uh, coming down the tracks on what organisations need to do uh, to incorporate ESG criteria and, and metrics into the organisation. And with this, then... We, we have a strong focus on the S part of ESG. And I think this is where companies are finding a lot of challenges at the moment is how to integrate the S in, in ESG. Uh, so the social element of, of environmental, social and governance. Um, again, we, we look at stakeholders like Christine talked about. We look at materiality analysis. So how, how you uh, and how organizations can, can assess how material different aspects are to different ESB, ESG aspects are to the organizations and how you and organizations can can introduce models for transformative change, looking at organizational culture, looking at how organizations can be in a, more innovative and the types of partnerships that are needed to address the SDGs and for companies and organizations to be more sustainable. Um, so that's really the content of the module. In terms of assessment, then it's kind of broken down 50-50 between individual work, individual essays and reflections uh, and discussion forums on what you're learning. And then a large part of it is this group project where you work with an organization of your choice. Um, you do an SDG or a sustainability screening analysis with them. And this takes place over the course of most of the semester. And then ultimately what you help these organizations with is providing them a roadmap um, and a set of really achievable recommendations or, or solutions or suggestions that they can implement um, on their SDG journey or on their sustainability journey. So these organizations usually are ones that are only at the start of this journey and need a good help. And I'll tell you the, the group projects that were that were developed just there before Christmas for the, for the first semester were absolutely of phenomenal quality. Uh, so hats off to a couple of the students that are here on the call. Um, and I've no doubt that that you will enjoy and produce as good quality uh, projects when you hopefully sign up. So thanks. That's it for me, Orla. Lovely, Johanna. Thank you so much. And I think that gives our uh, prospective candidates out there a real sense of um, not just the content in your module, but interestingly, the type of problems and, and challenges that are facing organizations. So in some ways, your module is almost a problem solving module and, and you know, students will have to grapple with those types of problems in the real world. So you really give them that that practice run, if you like, in, in your module. And I know students have really enjoyed this first semester with you. So thank you very much, Johanna, for your input. Um, I'd now like uh, to give the audience an opportunity to 
hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And uh, I'd love for you to hear from one of our current students who's taking the program. Um, so we're joined tonight by Mr. Ronan Concanon. Uh, Ronan, you're very welcome to the event. Um, and I can only say a, a sincere huge thank you to you in particular for joining us tonight. Um, because you're already very heavily committed to evening classes on this program on a Tuesday evening and a Thursday evening, along with all of your other commitments. Um, and I'm, I'm very aware of how busy the program is and, and we'll talk and maybe have a little bit of a chat about that. Um, but I really appreciate your time this evening and joining us, Ronan. Uh, thanks, Arla. Happy to be here. Great. So um, we might start, I suppose, with um, maybe if you could just you know, give us a little bit of a brief background to yourself and maybe particularly for the benefit of the audience, I suppose, you know, what drove you to this decision in the first place? Um, why were you interested in an MSc in sustainability? Um, and, and what was your particular reason for, for levitating towards this area, please? Yeah, no problem. So um, my background is um, chemistry and chemical engineering, and I'm working in pharmaceuticals as a medical device for about 20, 20 years or so now, uh, about nine months ago, I took over a, a new program around improving the sustainability of our product portfolio here. I'm working for Abbott Diagnostics out of Galway at the moment. And so I took on board the, the program to work on our product sustainability. And I very quickly found, you know, the technical aspect of it made sense to me. The regulatory aspect of it made sense to me. But that was only really a very small part of the puzzle. And sustainability involves so much more. And I realized I've got gaps in my learning, um, which was was interesting and, and 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 almost exciting, I would say, because, you know, having been in the business 20 years, it was nice to think, oh, there's a whole lot more here I can learn. I need to figure out how I'm going to learn it. And that I then found myself sitting in this, this the equivalent section, uh, I suppose, this time last year. Um, and and. I, I did, I did, I suppose, cast around for a number of different programs, and there were a lot of aspects of this program that made me think it's the right one for me, and I've not been disappointed. Great. Um, I might just directly pick you up maybe on that point. Um, what did appeal to you to the program? And then I suppose I'm, I'm hopefully setting us up here to not fail. I'm going to ask you then uh, the aspects that appealed to you. Have they delivered? <laughs> um, so, you know, what in particular drove you to choose? Because I I, uh, I agree with you. I think the sustainability space um, is an absolute growing area with lots of opportunities out there, lots of educational opportunities. Um, and there are many participants on, on the call that might have the same question as you, you know, why would I choose this program? So why did you choose it? What particular reasons? And have have those reasons been delivered? And have we managed to keep up to our word? Uh, no, absolutely. So I suppose th th there are two main attractions. So I looked around and first off, the flexibility of this program, the fact that it's, it's you know, largely online, um, is is a, is a huge benefit because I'm you know I'm working full time. I'm in a role where I do have to cover you know both really early time zones with some of our colleagues in Asia Pac, late with our US colleagues. So that flexibility of not having to be in the classroom, particular time I can work from where I am. That was huge, and um, and the second part of it as well, and it's something that you know throughout my career, it's always great to learn from from peers and learn from others and. You know, we love to do benchmarking visits, but that can be time consuming and hard to agree and get all that done. So when I saw there's two significant blocks of the program are going out and seeing real world examples straight away that attracted me. And um, we haven't got to that part of the course yet, but you've actually kind of delivered early on that, I would say, because the learning from the rest of the class, like the, the breadth of experience in, in the, the, the group that I'm with. You know, we've got people in medical device, we've got people in local authorities, we've got people in um, financial services, legal profession, like the scope of, of experience is huge. And then when you get to do like we did in, in Johannes last before Christmas, go out and work with a company, a practical example. I learned so much about the hotel business in the space of eight weeks. Um, you know, you're 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 constantly learning, and you're seeing how it can be applied. And and again, when you're working full time, and you're trying to boost your gaps in your professional knowledge, that's that's the best way to learn. 
Fantastic, Ron, and I, I agree with you because we hear it all of the time with these types of professional courses that it's the peer-to-peer -peer learning um, that's just as valuable as learning from your lecturers and your faculty. Um, I have heard that you have had many engaging debates, uh, conversations, um, and that they've been, uh, you know, very challenging and, and perhaps sometimes even disagreeing with each other in the classroom. Um, and I think that just speaks to um, the benefit of developing that network with each other um, and having the opportunity to have met initially and formed those relationships and collaborations. And then you can take that network and that relationship online um, and you've been really good at availing of those online classes, um, online discussion forums to engage with each other. Um, and I've heard that, you know, it has been great sports um, with all of the conversations and debates that you have had. Um, I, I suppose I would just like to maybe pivot a little bit and ask you to maybe just give me a sense as to some of the knowledge and skills that you feel maybe you've learned in the first semester that you've maybe been able to bring um, to your to your job, if you've had any opportunity to apply any of that learning yet. Oh no, absolutely. I suppose the um, one of the areas that surprised me was when we looked at consumerism and, and and consumer theory and a lot of that because again, I'm in a business where we're typically selling to professionals or we're selling to institutions like hospitals or health systems, and you don't you don't always think about the position of the consumer. And we have made a push into, you know, more recently into the consumer space, particularly during COVID. But it was a whole area I was kind of blind to. And then when you start to understand through that lens, and, and that's the thing, like, you know, through each of the, 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 the modules, we're getting different lenses that we can use to understand our day to day experience. So that one was definitely very um, insightful and instructful. And um, going back as well and, and trying to um, when we did the responsible um, business assessment, you know, to to line things up against the SDGs and to to see the interplay and the interdependence. Because again, coming from where I did, it was okay, well, you know, we've got a problem here. We need to reduce the amount of CO2 or we need to take out the 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 hazardous chemical. But there's there's you got to think then about the social dimension, you got to think about, you know, the the economic dimension. And um, so yeah, it, it it opened my eyes up to how these challenges need to be tackled from all angles simultaneously. Great. Thank you, Ronan. Um, and I really like the idea of looking at things from a different lens. Um, I often say that, you know, I think diversity is one of the key benefits that we can have to try, try and drive the sustainability agenda because listening to somebody else's perspective is so much nearly more valuable than your own view of something. You know, you really learn something different from listening to another view or another perspective. Um, just very briefly, I'm going to ask you one more question, and I know you, you, you've you really given us so much of your time already, so thank you for that. I suppose um, I get the sense that it's uh, an extremely busy course with a lot of deadlines, a lot of assignments, a lot of commitments. You have evening classes, two evenings a week, you're in full-time employment, um, and a lot of commitments. Um would you have any advice or suggestions maybe for any prospective candidates out there tonight that are thinking about taking on this course? Um, clearly, you have managed to get through the first semester successfully. You've balanced those deadlines and those assignments. Um, would you have any advice for anyone out there or any suggestions on how they might navigate uh, you know, the challenges of taking on this type of a commitment or course? Um, I, I I think embrace the technology, especially if you're not, excuse me, if you're not very technically adept. There's supports there. I know when we were on campus, we got a, an introduction to the the platforms and the tools. So I, I I think definitely engage with that. It makes life so much easier. You know, like I can do so much of my work just on my phone, having downloaded the app. So that's part of it. And um, I think engage with the the lecturers and with the, the, the program staff as well. Like there were areas where we as a class gave feedback and it was acted on and it's helped to kind of, you know, remove any of the, the friction points around it. And and the last part, and this is part I found for myself, you know, you, you, there, there's, there's the way the material is provided. You can kind of chip away at it week on week on week. Do that, um, you know, because if you leave it to the week before the assignment is due or the, you know, the week before the presentation, 
it, it it's very easy for it all back up and get on top of you or you know life happens and then you're derailed so the way that the material is provided there is the opportunity to kind of continue you know kind of do little bits and that's i found that to be very helpful for myself Great. Thank you, Ronan. Um, you know, uh, you've really described that real life lived experience. You've gotten through that first semester successfully. Um, and I think those insights will be really useful for our audience tonight. So thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate it, Ronan. No problem. Ronan. Thank you. OK, um, so I'd now like to turn to our industry guest speaker tonight. We are delighted to be joined by Mr. Connor O'Dowd. Connor is the CEO of the Port of Galway. But he began his career in KPMG, working in both Dublin and Galway as an audit director. Connor has served on the Council of Galway Chamber of Commerce for many years, and he served as its president from May 2016 to May 2017. Connor is a co-founder and non-executive director of the Galway City Innovation District, the operator of the Porter Shed, which operates an innovation center and space for startups to foster innovation and attract foreign direct investment to Galway. Connor, you're very welcome to the event and thank you so much for giving us some of your precious time. My pleasure. Good to be here. Great. So, Connor, we might just start again with maybe just a little informal chat, uh, maybe give us an insight to your own background. I know I gave a brief profile of you there, but Particularly, our audience might be uh, curious to know how you came to be in the sustainability space um, and, you know, how your career has led to this point, please. Yeah, thanks, Orla. So I was uh, um, KPMG for many years, as you say, in Dublin and Galway, and I suppose through the chamber and particularly in just a big events around the city. Um, so yeah. Galway, which I applied for and I very quickly saw the attractiveness of the port as a project both in terms of the new port and we're also planning to relocate the port and that'll give rise to an inner city regeneration project and that was obvious at the time I applied for the job. I suppose what's relevant to the audience here tonight is when I got involved and got the feet behind the desk as it were uh, it became clear that one of the, the stories of the port in, in recent years prior to my appointment was that a big part of our business had become the import and, and deployment of onshore wind. And I, I think people here that are around Galway would see the turbines coming into the port. And I suppose the way I see it, that's sustainability and climate action in action, as it were. And, you know, in terms of the, the port's journey, so we've, our biggest... Um, our biggest product by far over the years has been oil, right? And uh, still remains an important part of our business. But in recent years, uh, wind turbines, in particular um, 22 and 23, with a real good pipeline into 24, has become an enormous part of our business uh, in percentage terms. So to put it in context, and the people here will be well aware of megawatts, you know, between June 22 and June 24, we'll put through 350 megawatts through the port, which my guess is about 20% of Irish onshore wind production, which is an enormous contribution to energy. And, and, and critically, I suppose, so it comes in two forms. A, it's really important for the port in terms of our activity, but it's also very profitable work. It allows the port obviously, to, to reinvest and prosper. And we think critically that that work is going to continue into the future. So. I suppose in terms of sustainability, it's been a really important piece of business for the port. And as I said, you know, in terms of what we see in the port, you can see kind of the transition in action. I'll give you a brilliant example, um, two real life examples from uh, Cromarty, which is a port up near Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. And you could actually, you know, when you're at the quayside, you see that the oil platforms were coming in to effectively be scrapped and the wind turbines going out. So there you had it in a very real sense of kind of the, the old economy, as it were, you know, in terms of the oil exploration piece being wound down and the new economy being wound up. And interesting, the, the Rona made a point about consumer behavior. The other piece I found fascinating because that part of the world is um, very whiskey is a hugely important part of their game. And in terms of the hydrogen economy, which is a byproduct of wind, 
and I, obviously the application of hydrogen for industry, whiskey was the first mover. And I kind of got to wonder why that was. But it actually became obvious when you think about it, because whiskey is a product that's laid down and will be sold in 20 years time. And clearly the whiskey industry is taking the view that the consumer of the future is going to demand a carbon free product. So whiskey was an early adopter coming to the hydrogen economy. You know, there would be a cost to that. You know, uh, these technologies are, are, are not yet as competitive as, say, hydrocarbons. But I thought it was quite interesting that whiskey industry as a sector had taken that view because they're taking the view that the consumer of the future is going to demand a green product. Um, you know, it's refreshing, Connor. Um, I always love... When I talk to somebody about sustainability, I always love when they approach it as more of an opportunity than a risk. And listening to your conversation for the last few minutes there, I can clearly see that if, if wind energy is such a significant part of the business now for the Port of Galway, that this was a clear strategic opportunity that made business sense. Um, I have a personal view that I really think you know, sustainability should be treated as that strategic opportunity, as opposed to simply maybe just worrying about the compliance side of it and, and viewing it as just a risk. Um, you know, if you're if you're thinking of that first mover advantage and future consumer behavior, um, there is so much opportunity to be made and, and capitalized on. I suppose, though, you know, based on your own experience and what you're seeing in the industry, and clearly ye are you know, first mover advantage and capitalizing on that strategic opportunity. If you didn't do that as a business, what is the risk? You know, so I've I've touched on it and I've mentioned that, you know, we have compliance now coming down the line. We have regulation upon regulation. Um, so the advantage, you know, of upskilling in this area is to capitalize on the, on the opportunity. What is the disadvantage or the risk if you don't, uh, you know, upskill in leadership skills now in sustainability? Do you see that as posing a risk to organizations? Absolutely. And I, I think just maybe to, to divert a minute to your opening comment, I, I think that you're you're so right to look at it as an opportunity. And an opportunity, you know, for, forget our port and think more wider. It's an opportunity really for regional development in Ireland because we have got the most fabulous wind resource, you know, the best in Europe. And, and that resource to a certain extent, you know, and it's kind of a, a cliche to a certain extent, and it's been, but the Saudi Arabia wind is, is one of the phrases that's used. And it's very true. Wind is a natural resource akin to, you know, what, what oil was to, was to the Gulf. And it's something that needs to be harnessed and, and the spin-offs from that. And to speak to upskilling, like when it comes to, um, and the skills involved, and obviously in my time, even in KPMG, and I think when one, sees the the wind industry and whatever it's a huge opportunity for ports but also i think also for for the wider community and because there's a, a project like an, an offshore wind or an onshore wind project there's so many different it's so multifaceted there's the construction phase itself and you're looking at you know 37 gigawatts resource of in the atlantic coast that's what the government have stated by 2050 like with that kind of resource, you're not far off 100 billion, I would estimate, in terms of capital. So that's just the capital spend as a construction piece. Obviously, if, if Ireland takes the view to, to, you know, to start manufacturing those, now that could, could be tricky, but maybe they would just be imported. But then you've got the maintenance of those. Uh, so obviously, you're going to have crews based at ports going out and looking at that, looking at that, make sure that the wind turbines are serviced correctly. And I think what's often really poorly understood, and this, I think, is, is where the people on, on the call this evening will appreciate, is the white collar jobs that are involved in the whole sustainability and the energy transition. By their very nature, projects in renewable energy are extremely complex and, you know, just speaking for our own port planning project, which is, is enormously complex because you've got planning consultants, you've got environmental consultants, you've got lawyers, accountants, corporate financiers. It's so multifaceted and, and so complex. So from our perspective uh, as a region, I think it's absolutely key that we we focus on those skills. Like I've, uh, a couple of nieces are just going into college doing economics and law. 
And I kind of advise to them, you know, turn towards the sustainability stream because that's where the greatest economic opportunities. And, you know, it, it's it's no accident either. You see the, the big four accountancy firms, I see them mm. buying up niche consultancy um, companies in terms of the sustainability game. And that to me makes complete sense because as I said, you know, you've got the construction piece, which effectively say the more blue collar, you've got manufacturing. And if Ireland was really clever, I know the government are thinking about this, but you know, if you're producing energy and maybe it's byproducts in terms of e-fuels and hydrogen at scale, then you could be into a position where you're actually attracting industries which require vast quantities of that type of activity. So there's a real interesting kind of opportunity for Ireland should we cease to grasp it in terms of maybe doing industries or maybe heavy type industry, which we haven't done in the past because of that availability of surplus energy. So the opportunities are really, you know, they're, they're limitless really. And I think the Taoiseach put it well, I think uh, when he called it our moonshot for this generation, I thought that was a good way of putting it. I, I like the thinking. Now, clearly that needs to be translated into action. But I think there's a glow, growing realisation of the, the scale of the opportunity for Ireland. And I think critically, as far as I'm concerned, that I also think that one of the great challenges for Ireland as, as a country, we've been a successful country, clearly, but you know, too much of that activity has maybe gone towards Dublin and, and its hinterland. But the wind is the, the best wind is off the western and southern coasts. So it's a real opportunity, I think, to kind of rebase Ireland and, and put that economic act activity uh, that way. And just one quick little practical example of, of upskilling, which I like to give, is that um, one of our pilots, a marine pilot, uh, a marine pilot for many, many years, and uh, Bob Ellis, Captain Bob Ellis in, in the port, but to Bob's great credit, about 10 years ago, he saw the onshore wind opportunity and kind of, you know, got into that business, uh, you know, and his role was as a pilot. And Bob now with the port is effectively a dual role as a marine pilot, but also our project manager for wind energy, for wind energy. So I think that's a wonderful little practical example of one of our team who's performing a vital role of making sure that ships were piloted into the harbour safely but saw this opportunity and ran with it and effectively now has a dual role and has been uh, overseeing our wind turbine projects in the port for the best part of 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's fascinating that uh, there's clearly tangible benefits from upskilling in this area for any organisation. But what's quite amusing is that it's now becoming evident that there's a tangible benefit to being on the west of Ireland in wet and windy west of right. Ireland, which now maybe 20, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have thought that was such a great thing. But uh, we have, you know, the most fabulous resource right on our doorsteps. And um, very, very quickly, Connor, because I, I, I appreciate you've already given us a lot of your time. Um, I suppose very short answer to this maybe. Clearly you've outlined, you know, the benefits and the key tangible benefits from upskilling in this area, the opportunities that can be availed of. Based on what you're seeing at the moment, and you've a lot of interaction with industry at the moment, do you think there is a current gap in that strategic skill you know, that ability to be able to lead the organization, join those dots together, um, drive, drive this in the culture and, and drive it through the, the, the organization's culture. Do you see that being a gap at the moment for many, maybe smaller organizations um, and how or how do you think they're grappling with it? No, I think that's fair. Orlan. And even today, I was at a meeting with one very senior executive, and uh, it, that was the point he made. You know, the, the ESG and the S was the tricky bit, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and it is. Yeah. And, and as I said, you know, I'm speaking it from a port perspective where the opportunities are huge. But, you know, to be clear, the sustainability agenda will also give rise to costs for businesses who may be not involved in that. And I think, again, to speak to Ronan's point, you know, consumer behavior, what does it mean in terms of your demands? And I think that's going to go, you know, because and particularly particularly true in, in the case of the young, who I think are far more cognizant to these issues than maybe my generation. So there is that issue. What does it mean for my business? You're going to have to stay within the regulatory straight lines. I think the my old game of accounting, I think uh, sustainability is going to become more measurable. That's clear as day. That's happening already. These are, are complex matters. And I think, you know, green expertise in any organization.
organization is going to be hugely valued. As I said, you know, as I said my, my nieces are just that college age and, you know, they're going down a particular stream. But I would encourage any young person at the moment, you know, by, by all means, do your career of choice. But, um, you know, do it with a shade of green or maybe leverage that kind of green agenda, because I genuinely do believe, you know, there's two, and I suppose even from a poor perspective, you've got the mandatory piece. We're all going to be forced to go green. I think from our perspective, you know, we hope, we hope to get planning for a new port and we're going to have to do that in a sustainable way in terms of construction. You know, so there is there's cost and demands on us as a business. But I think that a better way of thinking at it from the prism of the West of Ireland in particular is opportunity. And in truth, the greener the world goes and the faster the transition and the better the developments in technology, particularly in terms of wind, the better it is for this region. So I think that's really, really important. And I think sometimes we can kind of be guilty of, of looking at the greening of the European economy as as you know, as a cost, it is a cost and that's understood fully. But if Ireland becomes this exporter of wind, which enables a landlocked country like, say, you know, Austria to take some of its energy, well, then that completely transforms our economy. So as I said, I look at it through the prism of opportunity. But having said that, you know, it. I think every organisation is going to be impacted in terms of you know regulation, compliance, etc., and certainly in the short term, there's little doubt about it. There's going to be additional cost, but my great hope would be, and we're seeing it. A great example is solar panels, which you know have completely, once the the Chinese in particular took up mass manufacturing, like the cost of solar panels has uh, gone way down. And I, I think that's there, there's certainly going to be cost incrementally in the short term, but the great hope there would be over time that R and D and the great innovative minds in the university or elsewhere put their mind to it. I think we can uh, drive down the cost of the renewable energy transition, and that's as I said, completely in our interest in this part of the world with the resources we have. Super, Connor. Um, you know, we could talk about it for another hour and we could keep the conversation going all night if we wanted. Um, but I really appreciate your real life insights into it, um, you know, and a, and a real example of a business that has really gotten ahead of the game, I think, and, and um, you know, utilised that as, as an opportunity, as we said. So thank you so much for your insights and your time on that. I hope that the audience maybe got a sense from that as to the type of conversations that take place in this program uh, all of the time between our teaching faculty and our industry partners like the Port of Galway. Um, you know, it's a regular feature of this program that we invite guests in like Connor. And we have these types of debates, conversations, um, you know, to be able to allow students to kind of join that classroom based learning to the practical insights. So thank you for your time on that. Uh, finally, our last speaker this evening is Dr. Sheila Malone. Sheila is a lecturer in marketing at the J.E. Kearns School of Business and Economics. Her research interests include consumer behavior, ethical consumption, responsible and ecotourism practices, food consumption, sustainability and community well-being. Sheila teaches the Consumption and the Consumer Society module on the MSc in Sustainability Leadership Program. Uh, Sheila, firstly, thank you so much for your patience in waiting um, until the end. And secondly, the word consumer has now been mentioned, I think, about four times uh, between Connor and Ronan. Um, so if if we did if we thought your area was not relevant, I think it has been removed. All shadow of doubt has been removed. It's entirely relevant for sustainability. Uh, I'll pass it over to you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orla. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I think I've just secured myself a promotion there. <laughs> uh, so my area, as I say, the students have me in the first semester. So I've just finished with um, the current cohort. And um, I focus particularly on SDG 12, responsible, sustain responsible, sustainable consumption and production and how we might develop or move towards a more sustainable livelihood in which we all live and society that we work within. Um, so what I do is I take the opposite angle, I suppose, from Johanna that she's spoken of earlier. And I'm very much about the consumption base. That's one of the biggest problem areas we have when it comes to sustainability. If only we could manage the way people consume and what they do. But of course, we're very unpredictable. And that's what makes us a beautiful context area for studying. Um, 
We look at a variety of different industries in on my module um, and I do two things at the same time. I offer the theoretical angles and views and perspectives around sustainability and consumption. And in particular, uh, we problematize the idea of a consumer. What is it? What does it mean? How does it impact society? What role do they play, if any, or, you know, are they hugely responsible or not? That's one side of what we do. And then we look at the perspectives in which they take. So things like consumers as interpreters, as decision makers, as have an agency, sociocultural agents. And we take all of this and we strip it apart, we deconstruct it, break it down and then bring it back up again. And a lot of that we do through discussion, in-class discussion. I supplement it with a lot of what I call the industry insight um, sessions, so bite-sized sessions where I get CSOs, so um, our chief sustainability officers from a range of top um, organizations in Ireland to give us uh, bite-sized talks into their life, their work, what they do, the problems that they see, the challenges they're facing. And ultimately they give a view on um, sustainability and consumption and what that means, where we currently are, where it's come from in our past and where it might go in the future. So. We take these ideas, we bring them back to the classroom and uh, we have a good oral conversation about it and a debate and we, we think about it um, in lots of forms. We also do uh, online discussion forums where I will throw up uh, a controversial statement and uh, maybe something that's happened in the news, maybe something we're grappling with currently, maybe something that's come from a, a, an industry report. And I just say, look, what's your point of view? What's your perspective? What's your opinion? What's fabulous about that is that the students come from a range of backgrounds, as you've learned from Ronan. And everybody comes at that very differently. They're going to hit it very differently, different angles, different life experiences. And that creates a lovely platform for us then to, to build uh, um, as the weeks go on. I try to provide a heightened appreciation of the role of marketing within sustainability and what that means. It's not just a promotional tool. And I think, you know, Orla and Connor have both touched upon the idea that it's a very strategic decision to, to take that route and to make it a part of the ethos of your business. And then we look at it from the consumer point of view and business itself. And we kind of marry this kind of triangle and think about um, how we might move move forward in the future. What's what's quite important in the module for me is that students are coming with what they bring to the table. And then we try to build upon that to make sure that you're advancing your skills, your knowledge, and that it is meaningful to you in that it supports perhaps the roles that you play in your organizations or challenges that you're experiencing. From an assessment point of view, um, I probably get to play with it a little bit more than other lecturers. Um, the students produce podcasts. So the first part of what they do is a group podcast and um, there'll be a topic that they have to deconstruct and think about what it means. Uh, related to their own work experience in life and develop that and put that forward. Initially, it seems a little bit like a daunting task, but I have learned from Grapevine and from the feedback that they really quite enjoyed it. It's a challenge to do, but fabulous when it's done. And then the second part of what you do in my module is a reflective essay around a, a particular statement topic that's quite current and contemporary, could be controversial in many ways, but it allows you to leverage that knowledge that you have built. And it's about that kind of depth and breadth of understanding and having the opportunity to present it back to us um, as academics. And that's it in a nutshell, to try to save a bit of time as well for Orla. So um, I look forward to meeting you and I, it's an excellent programme from my point of view. Perfect. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, I'm going to do teach on it, so I'm slightly... Um, uh... Okay, thank you, Sheila. I think we're connection is, we're crossing over each other a little bit. So thank you very much. Um, and, you know, it's always great when you have lecturers on the programme who are actually actively researching these areas um, every day, and then they're able to bring that research into the classroom. It just makes for really topical, really relevant material, which Sheila covers in her module. Um, so that concludes our, our lineup of speakers for the evening. And, uh, you know, in the interests of time um, and appreciating that everybody has many commitments this evening, I just want to briefly share uh, with you my PowerPoint slides and just briefly touch on the last slide very quickly before we uh, open the floor for questions. So uh, it's telling me that this is sharing OK, and hopefully you can all see that. And if not, maybe somebody will let me know. Um, but I suppose I'm very keen um, to give you this information for anyone that is really anxious to get some dates in the diary right now. 
Um, so, uh, you know, this clearly will be a, a commitment, something that you will have to, to plan and uh, plan your time and your schedule ahead. So I think it's really important for you to, to plan ahead for semester one um, if you are intending on uh, pursuing the program this coming September, um, then you can get some dates in the diary now. Um, so I did mention to you that, you know, most of the classes are primarily online. Um, and Ronan already pointed out that this was one of the, the key attractive features of the program, which um, and, and really the reason why we did this was to ensure that the program was flexible and would respond to industry's skills needs. Um, but of course, Ronan also mentioned, uh, you know, that benefit of having those couple of kind of in-person exchanges with each other. And so uh, we do commence the program with one in-person block at the very start of the first semester of the program. And this in-person block is absolutely crucial uh, to provide students that opportunity for open debate, conversation, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, collaboration. And what it allows the group to do is it allows the students to develop a class identity. Um, and, and begin to build those relationships and those networks with each other, which I'm quite certain you will utilize throughout the rest of your career. Um, so it's absolutely essential um, and mandatory that you would attend that first three day in person block here on campus in the West of Ireland in University of Galway. Um, and I have included there the dates and, and, and an outline of the activities that would be involved in that uh, kind of two and a half day block. Um, and it also gives us all an opportunity to, to get to know each other. And we will have a social event um, and we'll uh, have, a, have a group dinner in the city of Galway and have a chance to, you know, get to know each other on a professional, but also on a personal level, because as you've kind of gotten the sense from these talks, uh, the S is very much as important as the E. Um, and it's really about building those relationships and partnerships with each other. Um, however, the, the remainder of the classes then, um, after you attend that first in-person block, the remainder of the classes will be held online. Um, and, you know, as, as our lecturers have already mentioned, we utilize a variety of online teaching tools and technologies. So online lectures, interactive discussions, breakout rooms, group work, presentations, podcasts, etc. So we have fortunately, you know, become quite skilled now in all of these online teaching tools and technologies. Um, and are very confident that students will have a very engaging educational experience but from the comfort of your own home and giving you that flexibility um, to attend classes when it suits you. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Um, and that concludes uh, all of the talks for the evening and the uh, information on the slides. And I would now like to open the floor um, for any questions um, from any participants. Um, I believe that if you have questions, you can type them into the uh, Q&A function. Um, and I will just open that up at the moment. If anyone is thinking of any questions that they'd like to ask, please feel free to type them in. In the meantime, um, I will just address a question here uh, from John Killeen. And uh, I know, John, that you're addressing this question uh, to Ronan, our, our student on the program. I believe that Ronan has had to leave, um, but I will give a stab at, at answering this question myself. Um, and it's possible that one of my colleagues, Johanna, is, is maybe still on the call and I will check with her as well. So John uh, is interested, I suppose, to know, you know, what is the truth <laughs> uh, in terms of what is the real average weekly commitment required um, for the program? So I suppose, um, you know, just in terms of the schedule and the timing of the classes, um, you will have to attend uh, evening classes two evenings a week. Um, so the classes run on a Tuesday and a Thursday night. Uh, we generally kick off the classes at about 6.30 and we try not to run beyond eight o'clock um, in the evening because it's just simply too late for people to to concentrate. Um, so obviously, you know, that's a, a minimal commitment in terms of attending your classes. But uh, on top of that, 
um, you would be expected to, uh, you know, engage with the content and the material uh, in an asynchronous manner. So what that means is, you know, outside of those live lecture sessions, you would be expected to engage with reading material, podcasts, your assignments. And I would say on average, you're probably looking at a commitment of, you know, maybe around five hours a week, five to six hours a week in total for a module. Um, so including your class time and your commitment to your to your readings, maybe five or six hours a week um, for, for each module. Um, I'm just going to check with my colleague, uh, Johanna Clancy, and see if she's still online and she might give us an honest answer from her perspective. Um, if, if, you, if you can share maybe some insights, Johanna, in terms of what you would think would be required for your particular module. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> Absolutely, Johanna. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and sorry, what that question came from John from, Killeen. John, hi, John. Yes. Um, yeah, so Orla, to be honest with you, I would say that five to six hours is probably a lot. You know, right. uh, <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, I don't think so, John. I think really, you know, it depends too on the timing around assessments. So obviously you'd be spending a bit more time around assessments to get work done. Um, you know, I, I find that the one and a half hours that we spend in class uh, is, is more valuable than anything, especially with the interaction and the discussion. Outside of that, usually I would either, you know, no more than what Sheila said, either have a podcast or a case study or a reading um that students should do in advance or or that week in general i would say you know three hours max per module is probably definitely sufficient in terms of extra work that should be done every week but like that you know we're cognizant that people are busy some some students won't get to do that every week some students will do a lot more than that and again when it comes around to times uh, assessments um and those busy times, then it's probably a little bit more than that. Does that answer your question, John? Uh, yes, I think it does answer. John has said, thank you very much, Johanna. And he has agreed that that's very reasonable. So um, I must clearly ask, uh, I mustn't be giving my lecturers enough work to do it all. So I'm going to have to um, increase the workload on the program. <laughs> I should go back about 10 hours a week. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you very much for your um, honest assessment. And, and, and I suppose a caveat with that is that, you know, everyone is coming to the program with different skills, different competencies, and you'll find maybe what works well for you and what skill sets you're good at. It might be the case that maybe writing an essay mightn't be your, your best skill set and you might have to spend a little bit more time on writing skills. Um, and, and you'll very much learn very quickly how to how to balance your, your workload and your commitments. So thank you, John, and thank you, Johanna. Um, is there any other questions um, from the audience? We still have on the call uh, Connor O'Dowd, um, if anyone wants to direct a question to Connor, and uh, or other than that, um, any question for myself in terms of the overall program. So I will I will wait um, and give people a chance to type in any questions if they have any. Um, and in the meantime, I will again, I suppose, remind participants that um, you know uh, a lot of the information is available on on the program website. Um, that's really your first port of call for for getting information on the program. And uh, you know, Martini Huben Sweeney is uh, always available at the end of an email um, to to answer any questions you might have, and and we can certainly get back to you and address them anyway in in that way. Um, so I'm 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 conscious of time, and I know that you know an hour is a lot of time to commit uh, to a webinar at this hour of the evening. Um, so I, I I will keep the floor open for another minute or two for questions. Um, but other than that, I would just like to thank all of the participants um, who have joined the session tonight. Um, I do hope you found it useful and informative um, and that it has hopefully um, guided you, you know, to making um, a decision that I genuinely think you you won't regret um, and a, a decision that will certainly help you to elevate both your, your professional career, but also I think your, your personal life. Um, so thank you very much for, for listening and for, for attending for the full session.
Uh, I will finish at that and I will finish up speaking and uh, we'll leave the session open for another maybe half a minute or a minute if there are any other questions. Other than that, I would particularly like to thank all our speakers tonight. Um, very special thanks to Connor O'Dowd, our special guest, um, and thank you to all the teaching faculty and our students. Um, we very much appreciate your contributions to the program. Thanks very much, everyone.